Hi everyone, I'm Kyle McDermott. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the program manager for the Campus Sustainability Fund and a graduate student here at UW. I'd like to warmly welcome you all to today's event. I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the ancestral homelands of those who walked here before us. And for those who still walk here, keeping in mind, in mind the integrity of this territory where peoples, where native peoples identify as the Duwamish, Suquamish, Snoqualmie, Puyallup, as well as the tribes of the Muckleshoot, Tulalip, and other Coast Salish peoples and their descendants. We are grateful to respectfully live and work on these lands and to follow the leadership of our community members who are native and indigenous, particularly those who are from these territories. This land acknowledgement is one small act in the ongoing process of working to be in good relationship with the land and the peoples of the land, ultimately and ultimately toward decolonization. So I wanna quickly shout out to the Washington here on the UW's campus for the amazing resource and knowledge base um, that they are. Um, super grateful to have worked with them through the, my capacity with the Campus Sustainability Fund um, and really just want to acknowledge that they are central in our work toward an equitable and sustainable future. Today's event is a third of a series and part of an ongoing collaboration between the UW Sustainability Office, the Campus Sustainability Fund, and the College of the Environment's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office. The theme of today's event will be on racial justice and activism at UW, with speakers touching on the past, present, and future of activism here at UW. Please hold chat questions until after the keynote and during the panel. We will try to get to them at the end of the panel. Otherwise, we'll have an opportunity in the breakout sessions to um, further discuss those questions. At this point, I'd like to pass it off. Do we have... Um, Let's see, sorry, I'm just looking at my chat. Okay, I, I'd like to pass it off to our Vice President of UW Facilities, Lou Cariello, who will do a brief welcome. All right, thank you, Kyle, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to add my warm welcome to today's speakers, um, you know, our esteemed guests, and to all of you for this third uh, session. Um, yeah, today we have the honor to learn from our speakers and panelists who are leaders of diversity, equity, and inclusion at the University of Washington. Um, as a university official, I want to um, speak for uh, the president and the institution in you know, proclaiming that, quite honestly, equity is a uh, significant priority for uh, the University of Washington and uh, for my group in particular in UW facilities. Um, you know, I, I won't go uh, into too much detail here, but um, I've really enjoyed the sessions so far and will be able to stick around for most of today's session, although I have a conflict um, a little before two. Um, but, you know, the value of diversity, um, you know, cannot be underestimated. Um, where there is a diverse workforce, there is a diverse uh, team, a diverse organization, uh, better decisions get made, uh, more effective decision making, uh, more opportunity to impact things positively, because we are benefiting from uh, the different perspectives that we each have. Um, inclusion in particular, I would say, is the key in my mind. Um, I mean, true inclusion, uh, which means everybody on the team feeling valued, uh, feeling like they're truly um, a part of the team. That builds connection among team members and that connection makes us more effective. Uh, the, the whole in effect becoming a, a greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, but that connection and that teamwork that uh, is engendered uh, creates impact, positive impact, more effective solutions, and also pride in that team. Uh, where there are people who are feeling excluded from a team, you're not going to get the sharing of perspectives. You're not going to get uh, the capabilities of that individual who doesn't feel fully included in the team uh, to uh, benefit uh, the effort. Uh, and I'd say that, you know, I, I focus a lot on that piece because uh, it's, it's matters, it's what makes the difference in my mind. 
And in effect, equity uh, you know, can in some ways become a byproduct of true inclusion. If you focus on inclusion, equity will result. And um, you know, enabling access and opportunity to all, that's absolutely critical. Everybody, that's a fundamental human right. It's, uh, it's a founding principle in our constitution and what this country was formed off of. Um, and it's what we uh, strive to achieve. But when we can achieve that truly, we are better for it organizationally and individually. So I know the people on the call today have a lot of passion behind this. We've got a great program uh, here and I'm really looking forward to digging in. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's give a warm welcome to our esteemed speakers, Emil Petrie, Cynthia Del Rosario, and Danya Ayez. And Kyle, with that, I'll hand it back to you to get us started today. Thank you, Lou. We will now transition to our main event. As Lou mentioned, our keynote speaker today will be Emil Petri, followed by a moderated Q&A with Emil and panelists Cynthia Del Rosario um, and Dania Ayez. Moderating will be Dr. Tao Ross from the College of the Environments, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office, and UW Sustainability's Claudia Ferry Anderson. We'll be keeping an eye on the chat and time uh, keeping to give our speaker a five minute warning. Now I'd like to give, give a brief introduction of Emil. Emil came to the UW in 1964 and has been involved in some capacity with UW since. And has seen all kinds of student activism through the years up until the last decade. Um, Emil continues to be involved with the UW as a senior advisor to the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity. Um, Emil, you'll have 25 minutes um, for your, your uh, session and then we'll ask you to join us for the panel. Um, I'd just like to ask you to start off by giving us a little bit of background on what influenced your decision to come to UW and what was the campus like when you came here? Um, the floor is yours, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for this invitation to uh, speak to this August group. Um, I came to the University of Washington, September 7, 1967, now 64. Uh, and I came to uh, study chemistry. Um, I had a few opportunities to go to graduate school, including Kansas, uh, Purdue, NYU, City University of New York, um, and uh, Notre Dame. I chose the University of Washington because I had visited um, San Francisco and they told me Seattle was just like San Francisco. And they also said that race relations were great. And I, I yearned to get out of the Jim Crow South where I spent all my life. I went to a historic black college and university, Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And um, I was encouraged to come to the University of Washington. Um, so, and when I came to the UW, there were very few black, uh, black people. Um, but I searched out um, black people by going to the hub. And when I got to the hub, and you walk into the cafeteria. Blacks had the first two tables. So um, there wasn't much of a feeling alienated or feeling unwelcome. Um, we, we, we took over the campus like we owned it. And I think, I hope that uh, other uh, URM students and other students um, will, will do that instead of feeling alienated and not belonging. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is an abridged version of the first chapter of the manuscript of a book I've just completed. And it'll be about the story of the much heralded Black Student Union. So let's begin. When Larry Gossett enrolled at the UW in 1964, he noticed that there were very few students on campus who looked like him. That same year, Lee Levy, who had experienced racially motivated police brutality in San Diego, transferred to UW. He too was bothered by the fact that he seldom crossed path with other quote unquote Negroes. Although these men were not pleased with the circumstances, no viable solution were in sight. 
Two years later, Larry Gossett prepared to leave the university to join VISTA, volunteer in, a serv in service to America. But before that, he witnessed the first harbinger of black consciousness at UW, which occurred during what was then called Negro History Week. Levy enacted a slave scene in front of the Husky Union building. The slave was picking cotton and singing Negro spirituals. That happened 55 years ago to this day, February 10th. How ironic. According to Levy, he wanted to draw attention to a campus where black students were virtually invisible. He further stated, black people should not be ashamed of where we came from and never turn our backs on our ancestors, ancestors who sacrificed a great deal in order to ensure that the race survived. Levy's actions served as a springboard to what led to the creation of a program to support the few students that were there. That program was called the Afro-American Student Society. In the fall of that year, Eddie Demings, Berlaine Keith, and Eddie Walker, who were classmates, came from Cleveland High School. All three were very capable students and were eager to pursue higher education. Demings entered the university anticipating that it would be overwhelmingly white, but he had no idea how profoundly he would be affected. He said, I absolutely hated it. It affected me physically. We went, he went on to say, I was angry. And but a big part of the, what fueled that anger was the fact that my parents paid taxes. Why were not more of us here? The disproportionality was a blatant contradiction. It was a sign that something was very wrong. It was at this point that the seed of black consciousness was planted. Demings asserted in the words of Malcolm X, we've been had. The next sequence of events will provide the soil needed for the seed of black consciousness to germinate. It began with Stoker Carmichael coming to Seattle. Although a newly established chapter of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, existed, he did not come at their request. They couldn't afford him. However, a white anti-war group could. The political union, um, was sponsored by Michael Lerner of the Seattle Liberation Front who sponsored the event. It was financed by ASUW and with approval from the Board of Control, Carmichael was paid $500 and half the receipts of a 25 cent admissions fee. At the UW, at the UW event held at Edmondson Pavilion, more than 3,000 students, faculty and staff attended. Carmichael spoke about the Negro need to reclaim his history and identity from the cultural ter terrorism and depredation, self justifying white guilt. He criticized the press for his biased coverage of the Black Power movement. On integration, Carmichael asserted that integration was meaningless if not accompanied by power, that is, the power to maintain racial and cultural identity. Carmichael spoke of the leadership not being beholden um, to the white press and power structure, which implies white superiority, but it should instead work toward collective power in the Negro community. In addition, Carmichael spoke at Garfield High School Auditorium and was selected to speak to the community. However, there was resistance. The notion of an activist speaking at Seattle Public Schools facility, the school board denied the request. The American Civil Liberties Union stepped in and Judge Frank James overruled the board's decision, citing the right to free speech. A crowd estimated at 4,000 reported, reportedly was captivated by Carl Michael's words throughout his talk. The speech set the tone for the movement and according to Carl Miller, who attended, contained coded instructions for activists 
include an expected and emphasis on black pride, black power, and economics, higher education, a new emphasis on ethnic studies, an end to police brutality through political power. According to Eddie Demings, who witnessed the event, Dr. Carmichael's speech had a profound effect on, black, on the Black community. Before Stokely spoke, according to Larry Gossett, community, mem community members referred to themselves as Negroes. After, they, after that, they called themselves Black. It was a transformative experience. Those members of the Afro-American Student Society who were in attendance left the event inspired and further motivated to cultivate growing political slash Black consciousness. Further cultivation of the UW students' political and Black consciousness came about as a result of studying the works of a myriad of writers, many of whom were activists and revolutionaries. The budding consciousness was nurtured by reading and analyzing books about Black history from Africa to, Jim Crow, to the Jim Crow era, the struggle for civil rights in America, the history of Black people as told through their music, contradictions of the American dream for Black people. The seeds of political, uh, also before I go there, uh, from these analyses, students came to the realization that the issues were broader than what was happening at UW in Seattle and in the US for that matter, their consciousness expanded to a third world view. The seeds of political black third world consciousness were germinating among some members of the Afro-American Student Society. While this, this, the group was going through this transformation, Jimmy Garrett, a SNCC charter member and founder of the first black student union in America, along with other SNCC charter members, set up a, a Black Youth Conference in Los Angeles, California. Carrot, who had known Brisker since, the 1960, since 1964, when they both were field workers in SNCC, um, informed Brisker about the conference and urged him to recruit a group of Black college students to participate. Needed funds were secured and more than 30 students from Seattle, chaperoned by two parents, rented a Greyhound bus and traveled to the conference during Thanksgiving break weekend. Preliminary sessions focusing on different topics were held in the basement of the church on 42nd and Avalon. One of those sessions were led by Garrett. Garrett was a member of the Black Panther Party and coordinator of the Western Region Alliance for Black Student Unions. The mandate for action was to establish BSUs at middle and high schools, community colleges, as well as other universities along the West Coast. Establish Black Studies program, recruit Black students for enrollment, and call for establishment of a Black Cultural Center on predominantly white college campuses. On the return trip to Seattle, many of the participants were highly energized and ready for the above goals. To them, they felt that the UWBSU was virtually a done deal. Fewer than six weeks later, members of the Afro-American Student Society, after much debate, voted on January 6, 1968, to change the name of the group to the Black Student Union. With respect to gender composition of the group, Males outnumbered, um, outnumbered females by a ratio of two to one. Except for Verlaine's role as secretary, women had no formal leadership position in the BSU, a fact that many of the male leadership later regretted. Eddie Walker, however, artist of the iconic mural mounted in the ceiling of the Kelly Ethnic Culture Center, credited the women founders with making things happen when they needed to happen particularly Kathy Nafasi Haley, whom we call a general. It is important to note that one of the meanings of Nafasi and Swahili is rank. Haley's uh, perspective on the role of women played in the revolution 
was that it was complimentary and as well as supportive. At least five of the founding members were Black Panther Party members as well. It is important to point out that the racial and ethnic composition of the BSU is not hom homogeneous. At the time, the BSU at UW was believed to be the only Black student union in the country that was not all Black. Two American Indians, women, and one Chicano male also were members of the group. At the UW, the American Indian women did not encounter anyone who looked like them. They felt left out and were bothered by the way they were treated on campus, either largely ignored or treated as though they did not belong. Jesus Crowder had a similar initial experience. The entire membership of the, B membership of the BSU played an integral role in challenging issues of racism perpetrated by enclaves of the university toward black students, as well as the black community. Briscoe pointed out that the institution was racist and that the athletic department was the worst of all. The next step undertaken by BSU leadership was to examine the, the university's history of recruitment. None of non-white students and their subsequent enrollment. Efforts were expanded to conduct analysis of the status of non-Black students, um, African-American, American Indians, Mexican-Americans on the UW campus. The findings corroborated their suspicion. There were less than 200 Black students out of 30,000. And from American Indians and Mexican-Americans, the number was even worse. 20 and 10, respectively. BSU leaders' research also revealed that the hundreds of out of the hundreds of courses offered at the College of Arts and Sciences, none required textbooks written by minority authors, nor to mention that the course offerings were not relevant to the experiences and history of. American Indians, Chicanos, and third world people. Leaders in the BSU also investigated the UW's recruitment and hiring practices of black staff administrators as well. In all instances, their findings were disappointing. For instance, there were no black administrators, only five black faculty members, a number of whom were hired one year earlier. A tiny percent of the total of the UW faculty, which was almost 1900. Their findings reveal that while black staff were invisible, almost all held skilled positions. Moreover, there were no black person on the board of regents. On with these disturbing and unacceptable findings gathered over a four year, four month period, the BSU leadership began meeting with administrators, including Charles Odegaard, Dr. Eugene Elliott, members of the Faculty Senate, Admissions Director, and Office of Financial Aid. The administration appeared receptive, but the BSU members found them to be um, slow moving and using, using stalling tactics and uh, not making a sincere effort. So um, on May 16th, the group um, submitted a, a letter to Charles Odegaard with the following demands. All decisions and programs affecting the lives of black students must be made in consultation with the Black Student Union. It spoke of financial aid, financial support and aid to recruit and tutor non-white students. It requested 300 blacks, 200 American Indians and 100 Chicanos it stated that quality education through an interaction of diverse groups, classes, and race could be achieved. Something that it took maybe 50 years of, of research to prove that point. The BSU was prescient. They demanded a planning committee for Black studies and also hiring a couple of Black faculty. 
Shortly after submission of this uh, document, 10% um, of the faculty issued a press release stating that they supported changing the curriculum to include black studies and the hiring of black professors. President Odegaard responded affirmatively, but yet was still slow moving. Um, so the BSU decided that um, on May 20th, they would um, stage a sit-in at the administration building. We thought that uh, Governor Dan Evans was going to be there and we planned to hold everybody hostage until our demands were met. Luckily for us, he wasn't there. He'd probably still be in jail if, if, if that had happened. Uh, after a brief, uh, a couple of hours deliberation with the uh, faculty council on um, executive faculty senate and President Odegaard, um, he had uh, told us that we should leave the building and be assured that they would continue to work on it. So there were about 15 um, people in attendance from the university. Uh, half of them went with President Odegaard to an inner office, the other stayed with the BSU and its supporters. Um, once, once they got into the inner office, they were barricaded. So it went from a sit-in to um, an occupation. Then negotiations began between the two groups. And I think fortunate for BSU, there was a law professor who uh, volunteered to serve as a negotiator from the student group. And after a couple of hours and a few threats, an agreement was reached. Um, everyone was happy about the, the occasion and, um, and we all left rejoiced. Pardon the interruption, we have five minutes, Emil. Okay, I may make it. So what, what uh, transpired after that was uh, that um, the one main issue actually before the agreement occurred was control over funding and programs. And after that was agreed between the two groups, that's when an agreement was reached. Although the estimated size of the group of BSU members and their supporters varied between 60 and 150, the BSU participants totaled only about 20 individuals. Where did the remainder of the protesters come from? Besides Blacks who were middle school and high school students, the others were members of the Seattle chapter of SNCC, the Black Panther Party, and what we uh, call street brothers. Those were black men who used their wit and ingenuity to survive on the streets of the inner city and about a dozen white students. During the almost four hour sit-in and occupation, it was reported that 74 helmeted police were lurking behind a nearby building. But President Odegaard wanted to avoid any confrontation that was similar to what happened at Columbia couple months earlier. Those are the, at the scene of the sit-in were ecstatic about hearing that President Odegaard agreed to the demands. According to Edith Demings, we left the administration building in triumph. We felt that we had made our point and where we were on our road to get what we wanted. It is fortuitous that the BSU demands resonated with the faculty members present at the sit-in who worked intentionally and purposefully to broker an agreement between the students and the barricaded group. It was clear that faculty got it. And I'm convinced that they allayed any reservation President Odegaard may have had. These series of actions is considered without question to be responsible changing the face of diversity at, and inclusion at the University of Washington forever. Although considered one of the greatest feats in the history of activism at the UW, because it happened, because it happened in the Northwest corner 
of America, it received little notice outside of the confines of Seattle. Surely had there been arrests, injuries, there would have been national coverage. And if that had happened, it is unlikely that administration, departments, faculty, staff, and business community would have worked in concert to support the establishment of a program that has endured for 53 years. I hope the audience has found this presentation to be both interesting and informative. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you very much, Neil. We'll have Kyle get back onto our- Thank you, Emil. Wow, really um, just very insightful to hear this history and to, to um, take, us, take us back um, through the years and into a, a time that, um, you know, was was very very important for civil rights and, and student rights here at UW and, and nationwide. And like you said, it's only 55 years ago, and we're still, um, you know, uh, grappling with a lot of these same challenges, in, but in, in different ways. So, um, thank you for your your time and your speech. And I'll pass it over to Dr. Terrell Ross, who will take it from here. Thanks, Kyle. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Terrell Ross. I identify as he, him, and his, and I was looking um, while Emil was speaking through all of you, and I, I know a lot of you, and please forgive me for only picking one person, but I have to single out Dr. James A. Banks. It is so good to see you. And um, he was one of my favorite professors when I was here, when I came here in 92. So I just wanted to say hi, give you a shout out. And Emil, when I came here, you were always a person that people could go to. You always did everything you did with integrity. Um, you were accessible, you still are. And I just wanna thank you for all the wonderful things you've done for the University of Washington. So anyway, we are all uh, excited to be here and um, we wanna thank all of you that uh, showed up. So um, we have a great panel and um, we're gonna have this panel here for the next 45 minutes. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and uh, Claudia will be monitoring that and will be letting us know. And um, so I'm gonna start off with uh, Cynthia and Cynthia Del Rosario and I, uh, we were uh, partners in crime here in the early 90s here at the University of Washington. And Cynthia, I'd like you to introduce yourself by sharing your background and what influenced your decision to come to the UW? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Emil, thank you so much for that history. Um, I'm a Seattle light through and through, born and bred here. I have one of those provincial people who has never lived anywhere else but Seattle. So this is such an important, important part of my history too. Terrell, thank you. Dr. Banks, I'm so excited you're here. Thank you. And just everyone, thank you so much. Um, as I said, I'm a Seattle light, um, South End girl, went to Mercer, went to Franklin, where pretty much no one thought we were going to college. Um, I was also a foster kid in my teens, so struggled through high school a little bit, um, but did graduate on time. But afterwards, I was just trying to support myself. Um, college really wasn't on my radar at all. Um, I married young and became a young widow. Um, and then in my early 30s, to ensure that my daughter had the best life I could give her, I knew I'd have to go back to school. So after graduating from Seattle Central with an AA, I thought to myself, oh man, I'm way smarter than a bunch of people I know that have a BA from the UW, I can totally do this. And what I didn't know at the time was I was suffering very deeply from the imposter syndrome, which continued to follow me to the UW, um, where I was an older undergrad, UW was, was not, I mean, it's a little better now, but still really not set up for single mothers, certainly not my age, I was older than some of my professors. <laughs> um, and then speaking of Dr. Banks, uh, who is a revered professor from the College of Education, um, truly by accident, I took a graduate class in the College of Ed. It was actually a Geneva gay class in the winter quarter, um, educating inner city black youth. That was the name of the class. And there I met a woman who became and continues to be one of my besties. And she uh, was a 
graduate student and encouraged me to go to graduate school. And again, imposter syndrome. I protested and said, I'm not smart enough. I can't do this. She was very persuasive and supportive. I applied and got in. And while I, and when I was there, I met this amazing crew of BIPOC, we call them students of color then, BIPOC grad students, including Terrell. And my life changed forever then. Thank you, Cynthia. So next we have uh, Danya. And Danya, I'd like you to introduce yourself by sharing your background as well and what influenced you to come to the UW. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me here. It's an honor to be alongside Emil and Cynthia and so many people passionate about racial justice. Uh, so my name is Danya. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a first year master's candidate in environmental health. And I have an interest in community climate resilience. I'm currently a campus sustainability fund member and I am a research assistant in the collaborative on extreme event resilience. And this is actually round two for me at the UW since I studied bioresource science and engineering here for my undergraduate degree. And for a little background while I'm here, I actually chose UW as an undergrad because it was in state. And when I first came to UW as a fresh eyed undergrad, I wanted to experience independence, make a friend or two, attend at least 80% of my classes and hopefully figure out the rest of my life along the way. And while I was able to accomplish three out of four of those things, I actually gained a lot more than I bargained for. Because one thing I love about UW is that there's so many communities here and I've had the privilege to be a part of them ranging from being a cultural chair in the South Asian Student Association, um, being a part of the Muslim Student Association and also being an outreach um, ambassador for the College of the Environment. Um, and the sense of community and the versatility that UW offered me is what drew me back as a graduate student. Um, so I joined the Campus Sustainability Fund to give back and affect change on a local, sp local scale just because my main interest is climate activism. And throughout all these amazing experiences along with my academic interests, for me personally, I've just been trying to piece together what my definition of sustainability is because it's a really nebulous term that isn't just about the environment and really defining what that means for me. And I've been a, very fortunate to be a part of UW, which is, as we know, a, you know, a leading institution in terms of research and community and resources. But I do firmly believe that along with a lot of this opportunity comes a responsibility to reflect within ourselves and see how we can be better and do better, especially when it comes to leading by example, like Cynthia and Emil have done. That's why I'm really excited to be a part of this panel where we can talk about how students can channel their own unique interests and life experiences to drive change because I've seen it happen right in front of me. Thank you. Thank you, Danya. So now, um, as you all know, this um, panel and, um, is about student activism here at UW. So I'd like each of you to share the context of what the UW has been like in terms of student activism. And I want to start with your circles, your inner circles of the people that you hung out with. Uh, when you were here. Emil, can you, can you start that, please? Okay, uh, <clears throat> when I was preparing for this, uh, my uh, take was to talk about all the incidences of activism, or share some of those that mm -hmm. took place after the BSU's um, initial efforts. Um, and if, if it's okay with you, you know, I think you know I'm known for <laughs> changing the question to the answer I want to give you. Um, so Please. The, the circle, I suppose we, we could consider that to be my inner circle, um, mm -hmm. the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity and all the, the, the groups involved there. Um, so, um, in 1969, um, the um, Latino students, who, who at the time would call themselves Chicano, um, uh, boycotted the hub because they sold grapes. And because of the relationship with the United Farm Workers, um, uh, the students uh, objected to that. They objected to selling the grapes in the, um, in the uh, residence halls as well. And this, and the BSU and other groups supported this effort. It was led by our esteemed uh, Professor Emeritus, Rasmo Gamboa. And this group was successful in making that happen. Um, when the program was started in Minority Affairs, it was called the Special Education Program. And it was only participants were Black, American Indian, and We'll say Latinx now, since that's what we're saying these days. But Asian students were not included. 
So Larry Matsuda, whom I'm sure you know, um, along with Frankie, um, Tony Ogilvy and another student uh, confronted Dr. Charles Evans, who was the, the director of the program at the time. And Filipinos and what they call needy Asians were admitted to that program. Um, in 1970, um, black students were opposed to the University of Washington uh, playing BYU in, in athletic competitions. And the reason was that because BYU's, uh, B BYU's ideology, well, the Mormon's ideology um, was white supremacy. In fact, um, they felt that blacks could never be um, in a leadership position in the Mormon church because we were the descendants of Cain. And so that was protested. It wasn't one, but it, it uh, put the pressure on, on them. Um, and in 1974, um, the political science department didn't hire a Chicano professor who had been recommended by the hiring committee and a hundred of the students took over uh, Dean Beckman's office who was the Dean of Austin Sciences for half day and protesting it. That didn't happen either, but it, it what when you don't win, what it does it, it, it shows the, 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 the um, discrepancies in, in that institution and it eventually will, will uh, lead to that. Um, and then in, in 1980, um, the third vice president of minority affairs decided that he would change the admissions policy and have admissions exams and uh, other things that would prevent the students who had fought to get in to keep them out. Led by um, the Chicanos and the Asians initially, and I should mention another name that you all, you all know, Frankie Aragon was a part of that group. They protested for two weeks, demanded that Lujan resign, demanded that um, President Gerberdine get rid of him. And it went for two weeks, over 70 people were uh, arrested, but those policies did not go through. Um, so I'll, just, I'll stop there with, with um, but I had a few examples of, those are some examples that, uh, that I wanted to share. And activism, it was started by BSU and, and its supporters, but it, it continues. And it continues all the way up to, you know, last summer. Thank you, Emil. So, Donya, I want to ask you the same question about the context when you got here, and about the um, the students that were in your inner circle. Yeah. So, when I first got here as an undergraduate, I think my focus was more on outreach in terms of other students and college and environment specific. So, working with Barbara Owens and also academic by working in the Ames lab with Dr. Ray and Dr. Katya Milley. But I think it was as a graduate student where I focus more on the lens of activism. And this probably began with my time in the Campus Sustainability Fund, which I started this past summer, while I'm working on funding intersectional summer seed grants, which was funding projects that interacted on the social, racial, and environmental level. And I would say the organization itself is pretty much a pretty stark example of power of student activism and unity, because it began as a grassroots campaign in about, I think, 2009, where students were campaigning to push for a climate sustainability voice and they made a coordinated cross effort, cross campus effort to achieve it by recruiting like you know, 100 RSOs, getting faculty and students involved. Um, and they had to learn how to integrate this resounding student voice with the institutions by having the, you know, the difficult conversations in order to pave a way for having students and the administration to work together in harmony. And I'd say that probably this environmental activism was the first step because right now we're working on weaving a foundation of environmental and social justice into our actions. And we've been really lucky to have incredible people advocating for students such as uh, Claudia Ferry Anderson and Dr. Jan Whittington who served as our ex officio for I think about six or seven years. And I would say that the environmental and social activism that I've encountered with the CSF works on promoting student voices and funding student projects that bolster campus sustainability 
um, and social equity because we've been working on aligning with the UW Sustainability Action Plan and we funded a pretty broad variety of projects just because sustainability comes in different shapes and forms and everybody has different needs. So we funded projects like a meal mashup, which connects food waste to local nonprofits, uh, BSU's Legacy Soiree, the Intercollegiate Climate Network, and even ethnoforestry projects and a sustainable action or a sustainable action network. And that's just to name a few of them. Um, and the current CSEP program manager, which um, y'all met earlier, Kyle McDermott, he's worked pretty tirelessly to build an interconnected community within the campus cultural and environmental groups because event accessibility is pretty huge. Like an example would be the Earth Day event in Red Square, which happened in 2018. And that was largely co coordinated by the Sustainability Action Network. And also I wanted to do a shout out to our outreach coordinator, Fatima Brokim, just because she's been such a huge part of ensuring that the CSF has been able to reach groups that we hadn't been able to before and that we're actively engaging with climate justice and racial justice as well by evaluating our own personal mission goals. And I wanted to quickly talk about academics too, just because a lab that I'm a part of is working on how we can actively provide students with resources to succeed and how to reword our DEI statements and how to actually take our words and translate them into commitments that have tangible actions and impacts. And overall, I'd say I'm pretty happy to be part of an organization that is making racial justice and sustainability a priority rather than afterthought. And though we do have a lot of work to do, I'm pretty excited so far. Thank you. Cynthia, same question. Um, Kind of referring back actually to something Emil has touched on um, very organically is, I think my strength is in cross racial, cross cultural connections. And you could hear um, when Emil's talking that there's, you know, that BSU uh, was the initiator, but also drew on many other groups. So um, again, I'm a Seattleite and I, when I was, you know, in middle, well, we called it junior high then, in high school, there was the emerging of the four amigos. And that was Larry Gossett, who uh, Emil mentioned was one of the um, BSU students who um, had did the sit in that that create that resulted in the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity being created. So it was Larry Gossett, Bernie White Bear, uh, Bob Santos, and Roberto Maestas. They called them the four amigos. And these four brought communities, various racial communities together to work on efforts together. And I, I feel like I was strongly influenced by that and being a mixed race person and being relatively racial, racially ambiguous. I think that's been a strength for me. I can move among many and I do move among in many communities and that's my crew. That's um, Seattle for me has been much like that growing up. Um, in the South End where I grew up. Um, but for my activism, it really started again, again, referencing back to this College of Ed BIPOC crew. Um, we were, we connected up with one another and we were so grateful to have one another. And as we leaned on one another, we started to reach out to other grad students of color across campus, knowing that for many people, they would be the only one in their departments and how lonely that was and how lucky we were to have one another. And that eventually led to the creation. Um, Terrell and I worked together for so long and Terrell and I were part of a group that started uh, a group called UW Mosaic, which stood for University of let's see, Mosaic was multicultural organization of students actively, enga actively involved. engaged in, involved. involved in change. Thank you. <laughs> Um, um, which is actually still an ongoing listserv. I mean, it, it's, it was, when, what year did that start? Like 94? Yeah, 95. 95. And Carol, how many people are on that listserv still? Uh, probably around 300. Yeah, at mm -hmm. least. Um, mm -hmm. And so really it was originally supposed to be grad students of color across campus, but it, it, it expanded into include um, people across Seattle and in universities across the nation. Um, another group that was important for me was, and again, Terrell, thank you, um, introduced me to UWAA Multicultural Alumni Partnership. I was a student rep, grad student rep there. And there I met somebody who's a beloved mentor to me mm -hmm. and to Terrell, Auntie Viv, Vivian Lee. And I always say without Vivian Lee, there'd be no me. Um, through her mentorship and guidance, I really, um, came to understand that there's a lot of different ways to be an activist and that I could use my voice in a particular way. She, and she's also one of those people who is very, very 
um, her circles are very cross-racial, very um, multicultural. She really walks that walk and reinforced that in it. And through our work at MAP, we actually developed what, we, what was at the time called the UW Pledge. Um, we borrowed from the Berkeley Pledge and uh, the president at the time, um, Richard McCormick actually signed on to the UW Pledge, which then morphed into the UW Diversity Compact, which um, is actually the prede predecessor for what is currently the UW Diversity Blueprint. So although I think, I don't know if we can claim <laughs> you know, we're not going to try to claim like we did this, but you know, what I'm saying is you never know what the work you're going to do, the impact it can have and just, you know, work from your passions, work from your heart, um, connect with people. The other thing that I found really important was as a grad student, I got connected with GOMAP, Graduate Opportunities and Minority Achievement Program. It's a bit like the OMAD uh, at the graduate level at the UW and through um, my volunteer, I actually uh, started to volunteer there and then they hired me as a grad staff assistant and eventually um, hired me as a professional. They developed a position for me. So again, when you work authentically, when you work from your heart and your passion, you never know what can happen. I didn't go there thinking they're going to create a job for me, but it happened because the work that we do, this work is so necessary. Mm -hmm you know, the BSU, like the, the, the history that Emil is talking about, like those are things that happen because people are doing, working authentically, working on their passion and, you know, working for our communities. So um, I really just want to emphasize that this work is so important and you never know where it's going to lead, lead you and lead our communities. Thank you, Cynthia. So I hope you don't mind if I augment the, the part about the Berkeley Pledge because- <laughs> It wasn't we that did that, you did that. <laughs> and okay. you said, because they, they had an initiative in their state about affirmative action and we were dealing with that in our state. And you said, well, let me just you know, call the people or contact the people at Berkeley. And they responded and they were excited and they said, oh yeah, you can use what we did. And then I think it was you and Vivian decided to have the signing of the UW pledge at Garfield. Yeah. So yeah, we went, Garfield. you know, we went to Garfield and to get the University of Washington president to go into the community was a big deal. So yeah. thank you so much for that. Thank you. Yeah. And so now, so Cynthia, I'm going to stay on you. Uh, we're living through post George Floyd times. Mm -hmm. And um, there have been many unarmed black men that have been killed by people who took an oath to protect and serve. Why was George Floyd's death um, the one that ignited a sustained movement? You know, it was uh, sort of that, I hate to, not perfect storm, but that just combination of factors of the video was just completely unambiguous about the just the injustice. I mean, this video where people could see um, unarmed, incapacitated man pleading, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, and watching what happened. When you see that, I mean, I, I, I actually haven't watched it. I don't think I could, but just the thought of that, um, just clearly unambiguous. I mean, a lot of videos, people like make up a bunch of stuff about why that was justified or, or this, or what about this, or what about that? But th that was completely, um, and it's just unambiguously an act of injustice. And this is total disregard for George Floyd, I think just prompted so much emotion from a wide range of people across the nation. It was, um, this, the protests were sustained by a, a racially diverse group of peoples and has not stopped. Um, and this, this killing came at a really high tense time with um, you know, our, the president at the time promoting hate, promoting xenophobia. It was during the pandemic, there was high unemployment, high frustration, and it was just simply the last straw. Just the last straw, again. Thank you, thank you, Cynthia. Emil? Um, I agree with Cynthia. I also think that um, 
is I'm going to kind of use a science analogy, a quantum deal where, you know, um, it, it, I mean, it wasn't really a gradual thing because this has been happening. You, you notice in, in, in the, my talk, we were talking about police brutality um, in the 60s. Yeah. Um, the fact that you have this technology added to the problem, but it's also this buildup. You know, how many times does this, this have to happen before people say enough? You know, so it's like you, you gain, you reach a certain point and you make a quantum leap. And I hope that this leap is sustained. Uh, what I fear is people soon forget and you need another one of these incidents to be sparked again. Because six years ago, Black Lives Matter was having issues with police brutality, okay? And it went for, took six more years for this to happen. But I think the blatant um, exposure of this made it a, a, a global, a global effort. And um, it, it has sort of died down. People are, are seeming to, to forget again. And hopefully we don't have to go through this all over again. Uh, <clears throat> but one of the things that has to happen is when efforts are being made toward um, rectifying the situation, the pressure needs to be continuously applied because the, the strategy seems of those in power and who want to, want to maintain the status quo is to just hang in there and they will soon forget and we'll be back to where we, where we started again. Um, that happened in the civil rights movement. We should be much further along the way than we are now, but placations, people get comfortable and they, and the other thing is you got to continue, you got to pass it on from generation to generation. It has to be an intergenerational thing because the struggle is, 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 is long and is protracted. So there needs to be a continuous effort to not let the people who are responsible for changing the policies and practices that has perpetuated um, anti-Black racism, um, for centuries. Um, so uh, making partial um, um, amends is what throw human beings off. But the deal should be that no matter what you do, if it's the bottom line, if it's not complete eradication of racism, it's gonna continue. So don't, don't tell me about what you've done to, to make some changes. You know, establishment of task force to deal with this, deal with that, come back with a, um, a recommendations and then nothing happens. You know, status quo is a, is a tough uh, challenge. Sort of like, uh, you know, it's, um, you got to apply the pressure, uh, apply a force to use a scientific term. I see my friend Pat Staten's on here. I know he's with me on, on that, that idea, but it has to be sustained. Talking about sustainability, this effort needs to be sustained. Um, George Floyd, there'll be more George Floyds if, if we don't keep the pedal to the metal. Thank you. Tanya? Yeah, I completely want to echo what Cynthia and, and Emil were saying about how this movement had been brewing for a while. But the only thing I wanted to add is, especially for me through social media, I feel like as soon as George Floyd's murder occurred, it really opened the floodgates of this outpouring of so many other stories of people where they were in feel, fear for their lives because of their skin tone, how they were mistreated, they were arrested, or they had family members killed. 
just because of how they looked. And I feel like hearing our everyday friends talking about their experience made this event so much more visceral and really brought it home for us. So I also hope that this continues, these conversations as education continues, because I think a lot of our peers really encourage us to look at the institutions that we're a part of, like for example, law enforcement that comprise society. And I think the more we learn about it, the harder and more shocking it was to keep watching and to keep learning. And I think just the murder of George Floyd really was, like Cynthia said, just the straw that broke the camel's back. And I also do hope that it continues um, and that people are making more of an effort to continue educating themselves because there are a lot of stories out there. And, I'm, and even though Emil says that George Floyd may not be the last one, I'm just, hoping that hopefully it could be as we continue educating ourselves. I Thank hope you, so Tanya. too. Thank you, Tanya. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay with you. And um, so, so one of the, um, the, the outcomes of that is that there's a lot of new people who are now interested in activism in general uh, and specifically on racial justice. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, Tanya, what advice do you have for the new people we're getting involved or the people we're getting involved in activism for the first time. Yeah, so the great thing about current times is how we're all really connected by technology. And while I will admit that does have its pros and its cons, I think a huge pro is that even if you're a thousand miles away from UW or even if you're sitting in a new district, you can be involved in racial justice efforts. And I know injustice seems like it's very pervasive in every sphere of society, whether it's social hierarchies or economic systems or institutions. At least for me, it was very paralyzing to know where to start. But I think just picking a community or a topic that you have a spark of interest or a stake in, and maybe you know attending a group meeting, attending a panel, even sending an email, contacting a congressman or woman, I think there's so many things that we can start doing. And the outreach communities that I involved myself in just started off as emails that wandered into my inbox. They seemed interesting, so I followed up on them. And now through the CSF, for example, I've been connected with a lot of other campus organizations that are trying to make a difference, like GoMap, Institutional Climate Action, um, and this has all happened over an email and Zoom too. And one thing about this online quarter is I thought that I maybe wouldn't have that much of a community or I wouldn't be able to contribute because it is all online. But I think this has just shown me that um, you really can make a difference just by sending out an email or just connecting with people. So I would say um, whether it's like I mentioned, you know, reading an academic article about disproportionate racial ex exposures and climate change, whether it's just contacting somebody or speaking that you liked in a panel, I think there are a lot of ways to get involved. But the hardest part is just the initial step of looking. Once you get there, I think you really can make a difference. Thank you. Emil, do you have any advice for new activists? Yeah, um, I'm, um, I've become a historian in my later life. And um, I think it's important to study the history of activism, especially, um, I would say, from, from the 60s forward, especially if it's about um, tackling this issues of, of racial justice. Um, that it, we need to know what has been done already. And so you don't get excited about doing something that's already been done. Um, but to, to use that to build on this struggle, like I said, is protracted. So it's going to, there, there's a, I recommend that, I recommend reading. You know, when we were BSU, we, we have a, a reading list of at least 35 books that we read because this problem is, is really global. Anywhere where, uh, people have been oppressed and colonized, it's the same type of problem. Um, in America, it's, it's, more cent it's more central, but uh, what we're seeing now that the Black Lives Matter movement is now global and this effort needs to be global because the attitude of many need to change. And so when, um, for people who are um, getting ready to graduate, to go into programs that I, I would encourage them to, to choose um, to, uh, pathways that's gonna change this, this system because we will never be free as a, as a, as a country. And of course, people like me won't be free until anti-racism is, is, is dealt with. Um, so to learn, what has happened to um, take a, a step toward making a pledge 
to do something to change this. Um, if you're not a part of the solution, then you're being complicit in what goes on. And to challenge these issues of, of racism at all levels and, um, and to help educate others and have opportunity and to, to dialogue about um, removing all these isms that has existed for for centuries and to know that you know every everyone is a human being everyone deserves to have an opportunity to to take their rightful place in this mass of humanity that exists in the world. Thank you, Emil. Cynthia, do you have any advice for new activists? Yeah, I really, Dania and Emil, I really like your comments, the combination of knowing your history, um, knowing, you know, understanding where we've come from, and then that utilization of social media is so powerful. I, I feel very strongly that that, um, that was, key in the success to Black Lives BLM uh, movement with the um, George Floyd. The other, the other, another thing, I'm not trying to get too academic on it, but uh, thinking about social movements, social movements theory say, says that no social movement can succeed without support from dominant society. So in other words, you don't have to be part of the group to be part of the group. I mean, everybody needs support. Um, the other thing I would say, particularly, you know, talking to UW students is know and utilize our resources here. Um, the ECC, Ethnic Cultural Center, I know we're not in person, but they do continue to send out emails and you, and like um, Daniel was saying, she responded to emails and that's how she started to get involved. But the OMAD, the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity is so critical know and utilize these resources, the instructional center, um, RSOs, connect with people, um, community orgs, get involved with community orgs, find your mentors. There's people that want to mentor. And you know, this is some advice I give, particularly for BIPOC students, because culturally for so many of us, it is inappropriate to ask um, an elder to mentor us. Um, but people are, you know, people want to, to reach back. And so, you know, in the culture of the UW, when there's so, so many, you know, people like Emil, Terrell, myself, we're here, um, it's okay to connect with people. Um, and with the other thing that I want to say is there's so many ways to be an activist, so many different types of activism. So find one that works for you, that fits with you. The main thing is like Ed Stanya said, find your passion, work from your heart, be authentic. And again, just find that level. Like some people are good with the protests. Like I'm leading the protests. Some people are the scholars that are working on social movement theory. Some people are like, I consider myself, um, not the person that's going to protest, but I'm like the back scenes person. Like I like to work it from behind and uh, know where the doors are, know where the cracks are and open the door or put that wedge in there. So, you know, like make sure the protesters can get in, and, you know, like we need to work together. Um, and so that's the other piece I'd say, like make sure you work with other people, work together um, at a lot of different levels. And um, again, going back to MAP, Multicultural Alumni Partnership, Vivian Lee, uh, Terrell and my mentor, beloved mentor, she would tell us about um, the meetings at the kitchen table before the meeting that you're going to go into. She called it the kitchen cabinet. So bring your people together before you go into the meeting so you know how it's going to go down when you get there. Like just, you know, you don't all have to be in agreement, but be on the same page for sure. Um, and I, I have just found that to be really important. Terrell, I'd like to add it up add to what I said originally, and I think it's important to, um, to for not only new activists, <clears throat> but also um, uh, veterans and that make sure you know who your allies are and do not alienate them because they are not espousing what you espouse because they're in this movement, we call it in the revolution, you need people in all enclaves 
to be there, to advocate, to protect. So don't al don't don't alienate them because they're not out there, you know, fist pumping. And use the right fist, please, not the left. Um, when rather than um, everybody's out there screaming and yelling, um, uh, uh, like uh, 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 late Bill Hillier said, talking loud and growing a crowd, but to also know who are your allies. Know that I am always and forever will support you. I'm not gonna be out there marching. I've done that already, um, but know that I'm an ally and I'll never turn on you. And to know that there are other people who are the same way. And don't, don't throw them under the bus. Don't call them out in public. Know who your allies are and utilize them to the max. Thank you. So we have time. five minutes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Go for it, Carol. Yeah, we have time for one more question. And I just, you know, you know, I it's so great hearing all of you and um, knowing you. And um, you know, you're all demonstrated advocates for you, Dub. And you know, what is one accomplishment going forward? What is one accomplishment in the name of DEI, racial justice, sustainability? You know, something specific that you would like to be, uh, you'd like to see done uh, on our campus. And um, uh, Danya, we'll start with you. So it is pretty hard for me to choose just one. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that I want to start taking into account when we're talking about DEI is this premise of intersectionality. Just because we are at this crossroads, we have multiple crises going on, which I'm sure I don't need to tell the audience in terms of environmental, political, social, and economic crises. Uh, crises. And I think this also ties into mental health. And especially now with COVID and this disproportionate impacts of climate change, we're seeing some pretty stark inequities in terms of health and the economic consequences. And BIPOC communities are the ones that are bearing a brunt of this impact. Like for example, we're seeing black communities that are having higher mortality rates that are associated with poor air quality and out of water resources. And of course the glaring lack of political advocacy. And I think taking into account this idea that people have many different social identities that they are a part of, and that does permeate how we view the world, how we interact with the world, the policies that we should pass, and also that component of mental health that ties in it, into intersection, because all these different parts of your life that you live and all these identities you carry around with you affects your mental health. That affects how you present yourself. It affects how you advocate for yourself. It affects if you even know that you have the power to change things. So one thing I want to do is I want to believe really using through the CSF, just pass a lot of projects that focuses not on just, just the environment or just like social identities or just um, race, for example, I wanna take into account all of this because activism for me becomes about a balance between external advocacy for communities and also internal support for yourself. And because I think it's really easy to become overloaded or overlook one segment of society, I'm hoping that we can use projects, policies, and also just make our mission statements more inclusive to include also different identities that I was mentioning earlier. I just wanna say thank you everyone for your time. I really enjoyed being a part of this panel and hearing from everybody. It's been really inspirational and I hope everybody has a great rest of their day. Thank you. Emil, is there, is there something you'd like to see accomplished in the name? Yes, um, uh, there are a couple and it's, and it's related to, to diversity. Um, there are, and if, 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 whenever my book get out, you see there's a chapter about 50 next. We need 50 more years to change um, diversity on the University of Washington's campus. And it's because we have enrollment gaps of underrepresented. Uh, I haven't gotten into BIPOC yet. I'm not sure what that means, but underrepresented, I know. Um, access for enrollment, success, graduation. We need to do great put forth great effort to prepare underrepresented graduate students for the professoriate. There's a big issue that has been going on for 50 some years about not enough black faculty, students are demanding it, but we gotta start, we gotta produce them. There is a scarcity, 
and the scarcity is due to systemic racism. So there needs to be, you need to start at the graduate level and start bringing in more BIPOC, I think I understand it for this <laughs> uh, F, uh, statement, to, to, to the professoriate. Then you will have those there available to take these positions that retiring non-BIPOC people will be making. Um, and we need to uh, increase the number of BIPOC people who are going into the STEM majors. If you're gonna change the wealth gap of those communities, there needs to be people who are in those professions that are being paid double and triple. You know, the, the, uh, the income, the difference in income level between blacks and whites and Asians is like 20 or $30,000, you know? And a lot of the reasons is because of the professions they're in, as opposed to professions BIPOC people have pursued. So those are areas that need to be got at. And it needs to be um, not a one thing, but it needs to be a combination to change this. And once you change that, um, once you increase the enrollment of, of BIPOC, I think a part of this issue of feeling not belonging uh, negative campus climate, oh, that's going to be removed. If I got enough people to support me, who do I care whether they think I belong or not? I know I belong. And that's another thing BIPOC people need to do is claim the university as their own. Don't act like you've just visited and that this is someone else's school. It's your school. Your people have contributed to that school existence and sustainability, claim the school. Thank you. Thank you, Emil. Cynthia, is there anything well, you'd I wish like we could to just leave it on that, claim your school. I really like um, Dania's comments and Emil's comments. I really feel like the ex being uh, this education being accessible is critical particularly again at the graduate level, that's my passion, graduate ed for BIPOC students. That was not something I had ever, I didn't even know of. I'm not gonna take too much time because I know we're at the end, but um, my, what I wish um, or my goal or what it is diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice integrated authentically and holistically throughout our curriculum. It, act, it, it just has to happen. So throughout the curriculum, but also discipline specific. So like um, Emil saying, more BIPOC students in STEM. And the, what Daniel was talking about, she just named a number of different ways to integrate, it, uh, integrate equity into some of the STEM disciplines as well as policy, um, mental health, you know, um, what we're saying, water quality, air quality. Um, there's just so many ways that that just needs to happen for us. And, you know, like Emil was saying also, you know, we really need to prepare our, our people to be the leaders for the leadership, um, the faculty, but also leaders, the administration. We need more people in positions of leadership. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Um, everybody, let's give our panel a hand here. Thank you. Thank you Thank all you so much. All. And I am going to turn it over to Kyle. Great. Thank you all to the panelists and our moderators today, as well as those who are participating in planning a, a, today's event. Um, and I'm endlessly grateful for the history that was shared today, the heartfelt dialogue and introspection, and the reminder that we should not settle with the status quo. Uh, these conversations and reflecting on our history of racial justice Activism here at UW are important steps in envisioning a more equitable racially and socially justice future. Um, I personally look forward to continue to work uh, on forwarding not only this dialogue, but these ideas into tangible actions. 